This episode series was done in partnership with and sponsored by Showtime. How could they have disappeared? After all, this is a maximum security prison. There are visual bed checks every two hours throughout the night and guard towers high above the prison walls. But as authorities began to take a closer look, details soon emerged of a stunning escape, not over the prison wall, but underneath it. Hello and welcome to Real Crime Profile. This is Jim Clemente, retired FBI profiler, former New York City prosecutor, and writer-producer on CBS's Criminal Minds. And with me today in the studio is... It's Laura Richards, criminal behavioral analyst, former New Scotland Yard, and founder of Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service. And I am Lisa Zambetti, casting director for CBS's Criminal Minds. And I wish I had five mouths right now because I have so much to say. <laughs> I think your mouth. one would suffice, Lisa. <laughs> Lisa, I don't think your mouth has ever failed you in this way. So don't not. worry about it. This is an amazing series. I, it's yeah. amazing. It's amazingly shot. It's epic. It's iconic. It's yeah. really, really great. So we're going to dig into Escape at Danamora, the new Showtime series that we've been talking about for several weeks now. And now we are really going to get into it and talk about the behavior we see, um, not only just what we're seeing on the screen, but what they weren't able to include. There's so much more backstory about this this show, about this case. And, you know, when I first heard it, I thought it was sort of like a sordid, kind of a tabloid-esque case. And it is so far from it. There is so much to know about all of the individuals involved. And so I'm, I'm really excited to start actually talking about... Um well, it's the, the case story. and it's the show and the behavior because this is all built around behavior and relationships, Absolutely. isn't it, Jim? Yeah, it's really amazing. And they do so well at building the tension between the people, the tension of the environment and the prison, the different political things that are going on between the staff and the inmates, and then all the different stuff that goes on between the in inmates themselves. Um, so should we just jump in? Well, I, I was just about to say, have. actually, it's a stark contrast to how the show opens up, because it opens up with right. the blue sky and the mm -hmm. hawk mm -hmm. circling. Yep. Right. So you get this sense of freedom and liberation, and then it pans down, and you start to see Clinton correctional facility and just get the scale of that building and you start to feel differently actually with the music that's added. I, I just think it's an incredible immersive experience just watching it in and of itself. I think we already talked about Bonnie Hunt that she she actually starts the show with her interview with Tilly but then we do a massive Well that's flashback. Catherine Leahy Scott that's right. isn't it? Her character, the Inspector General and I love that scene where mm -hmm. you're seeing the suburban along the windy road so you mm -hmm. get the sense of the remoteness mm -hmm. but you first see her through the car window that's right. And I think we did talk about that right. with the actor Bonnie Hunt. Yep. And I think even that just adds something because you want to know who's in this car. That's right. And as the car's coming into town, you see the roadblocks, but you don't really know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so she's a key window, isn't she, into yep. the unfolding events right. of what she's faced with. And she's there to interview Joyce Mitchell. And this is all after the fact, after the manhunt, that they're sort of trying to just figure out what has gone on. And we have this scene between Bonnie Hunt and Patricia Arquette but we do a massive flashback and it's cold and everybody's coming into the prison. Right, and they actually did shoot in the prison and, you know, that I think adds so much to it. And I know Benicio del Toro and Patricia Arquette and Paul Dano all talked about actually being in the prison, although they didn't shoot much of it at Clinton. They did round the outside, but they used other prisons. But just how that really brought it home to them, how tense and intense that environment is yeah. and how they really want to get out of it once they'd been shooting because it weighed so heavy on their souls. Did you ever have to go into a prison to do any interviews? In your I haven't work? been into prisons, but secure units and, mm -hmm. and, and that sense, obviously prisons and secure units are built to keep people in. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go in there voluntarily, but for Ben Stiller, he's having to think about the shift patterns. He has to stop shooting. You know, they have to change everything that, that they're doing to create that authenticity and I think you know certainly when I heard Benicio del Toro speak about it um, and Eric Lang actually he said how much it, it helped them get into the character 
And I think changing their appearance as well, certainly for Eric Lang and Patricia Arquette, when you're looking in the mirror and you're seeing a different face looking back at you yeah. and you're carrying all this extra weight and just this imposing kind of feeling constrained within the prison walls, I think is a very interesting thing for, for this show and yeah. the way that they have done such an incredible job at taking us, the viewer, inside the scenes. You feel like you're there. You're totally immersed. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely, it's dark and it's claustrophobic and it's foreboding. It's just and the other thing that I think you get for sure during the course of this series is the bitter cold and the isolation. I mean, can you imagine not only is this like one of the coldest places in the United States of America, but this is a prison in the coldest place in yeah. the United States of America. And well, they called it little Siberia. Yeah, they don't heat those places yeah. like thoroughly all through, you know, in every place. And so these guys are there in this cold steel and concrete building for most of their lives. Yeah. And, and they're there for good reason. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well. And, and you can see the townspeople kind of trudging to work. It's almost like they're going to a factory or a mill. And I don't know if you remember when you lived in New York, Jim, or if this ever happened to you, but when you live in that kind of cold, it's so cold and you're bundled up so much, but you're sweating. Yeah. And like, the sweat is like coming down your back and it's so uncomfortable and you get into um, a building and usually it's overheated. Right. And then you see that actually when Patricia Arquette in the beginning of, of the show when she's trudging to work with her husband, oh, Lyle, and they're going in. And she takes off her coat and what she's wearing like a tank top, like a turquoise tank top that shows – it leaves nothing to the imagination, you know, and it just... It, <laughs> and she gets in trouble for it. And, yeah. And we go into this tailor shop where there's just it, it, a man upon man upon man sew, sewing. And it is an odd it's sight kind to of, see It's a kind bunch of bizarre of to see a bunch guys. of maximum security prisoners. And they got into maximum security because they did some serious violent acts. Right. Murderers, rapists. Yeah. Bad guys. And... But they're sitting there at a sewing machine, which seems Delicate. like a very yeah. contradictory, dichotomous situation. Uh, yes, and it's it also it's a and it's a female sitting at the head of all these big, scary-looking men, and she's like, "Hey guys, what are we going to listen to today?" And she turns on the radio, and you immediately see that she's at ease. She likes being there. She mm. just got out well, of the car. Which is not just at ease. You yeah. see a complete shift in her demeanor, yeah. going from sort of an invisible female in this remoteness who you could blink and walk past and, and miss, to when she goes in there, she takes off her, her coat and she clearly is enjoying being, yeah. I, I called her the queen. You know, yeah. she looks, she's smiling and she's so smug. And she's like, what kind of music are we going to listen to? Hip hop or classic? And then she decides, oh, we're going to listen to pop. And then on goes the radio and the music blasting out again is another contrast to right. these men <laughs> sat there, these hardened criminals all kind of bopping away whilst they're Sewing. sewing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sewing. And what are they sewing? They're actually sewing uniforms for state employees and other prisoners and things like that. And so they're doing this job and I'm sure they're happy to have this job because yes. otherwise they'd be sitting on their butts doing nothing, no, just wasting are away. Very valuable. Yeah. yeah. And then on top of that, for Tilly, this is her opportunity to be someone special, to be to in control. To shine, yeah, to have to, attention on to, her. It, yeah, attention, but also to be able to direct other people what to do, to have some control in her life. And I think they build this character very expertly. Mm -hmm. You know, they show sort of, sort of the minute nature of her life, the little details of her drudgery mm -hmm. and her home life. And then she gets there and all these men have to do what she says. Right. And very quickly, we focus in on two men in particular, two. They're clearly inmates and they're sewing. And um, we focus on the character of David Sweat, who's played by Paul Dano. And just to, so you can kind of, it's kind of hard to keep track of all these characters. So I just really want to paint you the picture of Paul Dano is this tall, lean, buzz cut guy with a kind of an orange ginger goatee and he's just got this sweet puppy dog face and these big brown eyes you I mean, and your so ginger goatees yeah. let me just tell you whenever <laughs> lisa just for the people out there who can't see lisa whenever she says the word ginger she seems to get this smile 
Well, that just doesn't and, come anywhere else. Ginger and Bob. Yeah, that's what saying. <laughs> Those two words is yeah. a combination. Well, Jim knows that in every episode of Criminal Minds, I try my best to cast a redhead. It doesn't always work out, but I do try. Anyway, but so... But I would describe him slightly differently. For me, sure. he's weaselly. Mm. I mean, yeah. I, I don't see what you're seeing, Lisa. I agree so. with you, Laura. Interesting. He seems a bit slimy. But he's in sort of a managing capacity. He he's is. like the assistant manager yes. in this well, actually, showing the, yeah, shop. The real David Sweat had actually worked in that those different tailor shops for 10 years. He was an expert. He was the teacher. And all of the civilians who, you know, quote, unquote, were his supervisors actually turned to him constantly to fix things. And right. to he fix knew the, the machines. He, knew, yeah. he knew how to fix bobbins and all those other stupid little things that I don't even know what they are. <laughs> right. I think you do, Jim. <laughs> you just offered up bobbins. So <laughs> yeah. I... Oh, I heard him say it. That's why. Yeah, but he made the, I mean, he's in, in an interview. I've read several interviews with him. You know, he made their lives easier. He made the civilian workers their oh, yeah. lives much easier. And he, he was very productive. Yeah, yes. he kept everybody on track. He made sure all the machines were working. He made sure everybody had what they needed. But right away, he may yeah. have done a little yeah. bit more, too. You can see he's a little bit of the cock of the walk. Are you familiar with that, that term? I I'm think not. I've heard it before. Yeah, because you can see um, Tilly. It's like cocky cat, kind of. Kind of like, yeah, I... I, I I run this roost. And she's like, inmate sweat, can you help me with the thing and the thing? And you see everybody kind of look at him like, okay, here we go. We know what's we going on. We know what's going on, yeah. yeah. And, you know, very, very, very dangerous thing for Tilly to do, to be so blatantly upfront about the fact that she's isolating him in a room alone where nobody else can be and a place where there's no cameras. Right. The other inmate that we quickly... Um, focus on, and he's he needs no introduction, but it's uh, Benicio Del Toro is one of the other inmates, and he really stands out, not just because we know who he is, but he looks much different. He's got this slicked back black hair that looks like shoe, and he's so overly black. It's like shoe polish, It's and it shows me, like, the vanity of this guy, that he, you know, he just cannot go gray, uh, of the character, I mean, of Got Ricky it. Matt. And he's 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 both um, lupine and reptilian in the way that wow. he, he kind lupine of Wow, lupine and reptilian. You might have to... <laughs> <laughs> like define Unpack lupine to us, me Lisa. because well, I'd say he's strapping and dangerous. Yes, and alpha, yes, incredibly yes, alpha, uh, masculine. You know, you feel his power. But he's very he he's watching everybody. He's calculating everything, and he's got this sort of wolfish hunger to wh- the way he's looking around. That is very hot and and alpha, as you say. But there's also this reptilian coolness where he doesn't feel. And I get the feeling that he's just so calculating yeah. in in working people. So he wants what he wants. He's he's hungry for what he wants. Dominate or be dominated. Yeah. Right. That's and I what think you get a sense of him, you know, right out the gate. That he, yeah. you're right. He's assessing everyone, everything. He doesn't miss a beat around yeah. behavior. Right. And his character, the way Benicio plays this character, is uh, he's very quiet and deliberate. He doesn't speak all of the time. He's actually quiet most of the time. Mm -hmm. And when he speaks, there's a deliberateness to it, and there's a goal to every word that comes out of his mouth. He's not wasting a single word, a single breath, and he's clearly in control. And there's this whole series of scenes with a new young inmate. It's true that Richard Matt, Ricky, Ricky Matt, held a huge amount of power in this in this place and people went to him when they needed things and he could get things for anybody and he had a lot of transactions going on in and out of the prison not just as we'll come to know later but um, with uh, Joyce Mitchell but with other people bringing him things. This episode is brought to you by Showtime and the new limited event series Escape at Danamora directed by Ben Stiller and starring Benicio Del Toro, Patricia Arquette, and Paul Dano. Based on bizarre but true events, Escape at Denimora tells the story of two prisoners who broke out of a maximum security prison in upstate New York, and their twisted relationship with the female prison employee who aided in their escape. Thrilling, emotional, dark, and unbelievable. In the town of Denimora, it's not just the prisoners who are looking for a way out. Watch Escape at Denimora, now streaming, only on Showtime. Hi, lovely listeners. It's that time of year again where we have to think about gifts for our loved ones. 
Well, an electric toothbrush probably doesn't immediately spring to mind. But if you're looking for something practical that's perfect for everyone, then Quip has the perfect solution. Your loved one will thank you for it, and they'll think of you every morning and every night. There's a colour to suit everyone, and Quip doesn't require a clunky charger, and it runs for three months on just one charge. I love my Quip toothbrush as it's perfect for travelling, and your giftee will love it too. Check out Quip's thousands of verified five-star reviews. Quip looks like a big-ticket tech gift with a stocking filler price starting at just $25. And if you go to getquip.com slash realcrime right now, you get your first refill pack for free with a Quip electric toothbrush. But you don't have to tell your gifty that. That's your first refill pack for free at getquip dot com slash realcrime. You might see anything else in a movie before you're going to see a middle-aged woman without a Playboy bunny body in the bright light of day, having sex and enjoying her sexuality and being unapologetically sexual. That's a real thing that happens in the world every day. Millions and millions of people, and yet it's something that's like so strange. We haven't seen it in a film. <laughs> I don't know what we're doing here in film. <laughs> we're not really talking about human beings. She's no hero, but it doesn't matter, hero or anti-hero. Human beings are sexual. I just want to also talk about Tilly, because that scene, the first sex scene... Yeah, we need to talk about that. Yeah, is incredibly brave. I mean, I wanted to talk about her as an actor, first of all, but, you know, the fact that she puts on all this weight, you know, more than 40 pounds and, you know, is very uncomfortable in in her own skin because she's no longer herself. You know, she talks about that on her interviews. Um, but the fact that there's no makeup, you know, it's, it's a very vulnerable place. You know, it's not a glamorous role that she's playing in here. The, the vulnerability is in, you know, the fact that here's a middle-aged woman. You know, there's this fairly graphic sex scene. Very. And I don't think I've, any, I've seen very many scenes like that before in, you know, big productions like this. Yeah, it is a choice when you're going to show an actress's breasts, obviously, and you can't really show much more of a man's naked body. I mean, sometimes you can, but in this, you don't see Paul Dano's body. I think you see his ass maybe a little bit. Oh, but it's more from the point of view that we're seeing, you know, this kind of frumpy, uh, middle-aged female that she's inhabiting, mm -hmm. you know, who is sexually voracious. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, for Patricia Arquette, you know, this isn't a glamorous role that she's taking. There's no, there, there's no makeup involved. In fact, every, all the makeup that's placed on her to make her skin blotchy, you know, mm -hmm. she's got alcohol put on her skin. She's wearing dentures so that she speaks in this funny way. The glasses, you know, she truly does inhabit Tilly. But I think the sex scenes even more so show this vulnerability about Well, her. and a demeaning sort of position that she's put in. Right. And, you know, at the same time as she's sort of getting a rush out of this, she's also kind of stooping pretty low. Yeah, but I mean, it's all on her terms, really, right? I mean, she invites him back there. He can't just go there by himself. Correct. I mean, she is in control here. And I think we're going to talk a lot in this series about who's manipulating who this. But she has the power. I mean, if she gets mad at him, she can easily say, so-and-so touched me, and he's out of there. So I, I think that she will, even though she seems kind of mousy and this and that to us, I mean, she's got a lot of power. And in fact, David within Sweat, the prison, within the prison, and, and even David Sweat ha was written up by other civilians who, you know, thought he was too much of a know-it-all and this and that, and he would get in trouble. So, you know, she knows the kind of power that she can have over these guys. But he also knows too, you know, and you get the sense that because we jump into that scene, we don't know the history behind, you know, how long have they been working together and how that relationship sort of came to pass because what you see of him is he goes in there, he knows exactly what's going to happen. He takes his trousers down, yeah, she assumes yeah. the position, yeah. and they know they've got, you know, what, no. 90 seconds on the <laughs> clock. <laughs> Maybe that much. Maybe yeah. not even that to yeah. deliver. And then, you know, they buckle back up and out they go again. Yeah. And all these looks are passed across from the corrections officer they to. All, yeah, they, they all, all know. seem to know, yeah. right? Yeah. But exactly. yet nobody says a thing other than when Sweat walks across to Matt, 
you know, he makes this comment, which is which intrigued me, you know, where he says, well, I can't help it if the dumb bitch likes me. Yeah. And it's kind of like thrown away. But then as we see, you know, the characters and the relationship unfolds, actually, there seems to be something else going on rather than just that, you know, that passed off comment. Well, what's interesting about it is it does kind of put a note on the fact that it's dangerous for both of them. Because if she doesn't rat him out, if she doesn't get him in trouble, that's not his only risk here. If other people start talking about it, if other inmates get jealous, if the other guards start seeing this pattern, he can get in trouble there. And that is that could be a very bad thing for him because you get in trouble there after he's worked 10 years to get to this assistant supervisor position, all his benefits can get yanked away. Sure. But maybe, Jim, that's part of the excitement. Mm. You know, that risk-reward and mm. that kind of heightened sense that makes it even more sexually charged. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, and it could also be just, I mean, life in prison is kind of boring for inmates. And Everything so, about it is yeah. dull and right. mundane and monotonous right. and this it's kind of trudgery. Right. And so here you get this window of excitement that happens within 90 seconds, right, within that storeroom. Yeah. And out they come. And, it, and it's that transition of how they just button down completely and then go back to right. their stations. But he makes that comment to, to Matt, but then you see her, cut to her, and she's sat up on her station grinning like a Cheshire yeah, cat. Right. She'd been in there for about a year, I guess they've been working in there, and she was close to actually, you know, a lot of the guys there. She would bring them, not just Matt and and Sweat, but she would bring everybody, you know, leftovers and candy and this and that. And when her father died, David Sweat actually made her a sympathy card and had all the guys sign it. So in this little tailor shop, there was some human kindness of a sort happening even though it may have been manipulated and well relationships and, yeah and that's I, what happens when human sure. beings come into contact with each other sure and i think you know that microcosm that of course there are relationships that that happen that's part of human nature is that we all want to be loved and accepted and you know have a form of intimacy and so what mm -hmm. we're seeing in there is is pretty much that it's its own little world and she is the head of it so when they leave the the tailor shop we're going to come to the next um <laughs> most intimate relationship is really this with Ricky Matt and Gene Palmer, played by the great David Morse. And Gene Palmer was a corrections officer who had a quite, uh, quite a bit of freedom in the prison. He could go where other people couldn't. And he has a very bromantic relationship with Ricky Matt. So it's interesting that where, where Joyce would come to get in trouble for her relationship with Sweat, nobody seemed to ha care that much about how close this CEO was with, right. with uh, Benicia Del Toro's character. No questions are asked. I mean, you know, is it a bromance or is it a power and control dynamic that's being played out? Yeah, or is it um, methodology to, and maybe this is what you're alluding to, methodology for a corrections officer to maintain control and maintain sort of, um, I don't know, a less antagonistic environment. In other words, he's got to go there to work. If all the inmates hate him, then, you know, it's not a fun place to be. So if he can get this guy who seems to be able to control other inmates, who seems to be sort of looked up to as an example by the other inmates, then that's the guy you want to keep happy and therefore the other inmates will step in line. Right, and there will always be an alpha dog, somebody who is at the top of the tree. Now, at the time of the, the escape, within that prison, there were 2,653 inmates and 1,283 staff. So, you know, again, this is the honor block, so it's a specific area where we hear that some of those individuals felt they were quite entitled and, and privileged, and they kind of were, mm. I mean, to a degree. So is it him trying to maintain that control? You know, and I think we talked about it before, but the last escape was in 1912, so 100 years before, and that main wall was erected in 1887, just for a few facts about the maximum security yeah. facility itself. And the only other escape was from a minor outbuilding. It wasn't from the main maximum security area. So this is the first escape ever from that. 
Right, and that's kind of amazing just when you see how it's being characterised of just all the sort of the security or the lack thereof mm. of security. They're not going through the metal detectors and just as it, as it unfolds, you see that what Catherine Leahy Scott spoke about, this kind of culture of carelessness and mm. complacency, I mean, that is what you're seeing mm -hmm. before your very eyes. And th there is this constant question of who's running who. Yeah. Right from, since you mentioned, Catherine, right, right from her report, it says, according to many interviews, Matt and Sweat were Palmer's boys. Palmer was their boy, each looking out for each other. An inmate testified that Palmer and Matt were tighter than two peas in a pod, and they developed a trusting relationship, and that Matt said he would kill any inmate who assaulted Palmer. So that, that, that's probably a lot. To, yeah, well, remember uh, that, you know, you know, when we're thinking about Sweat and Tilly, nobody else is getting any benefit from that relationship. Whereas here, between uh, Matt and Palmer, other people get the benefit, right. right, of contraband and goods and, you know, bars being lifted on telephone calls, etc. So other people, it's kind of reciprocal in many ways. So, what, you know, I just picked up on the fact because you said bromance, mm -hmm. but actually many people do benefit from that relationship. Exactly. So we see more about, you know, Palmer and Matt's relationship in the discussion that they're having when the sort of the younger inmate comes up to them and starts interrupting their conversation. And right. you get a sense Matt thinks he's quite disrespectful. He's a newbie. He doesn't know anything. He yeah. doesn't know the rules. You know, yeah. every place has the rules. And that could get you killed in prison. Yeah, and that's what he makes very clear. And when he's trying to sort of joke about it, he feels he's still being disrespected. So you, you then get this tag team of Palmer and Matt on this guy. Hey, my man, you Richard Matt? Excuse me. There's two men talking here. Yeah, I know. I wanted to ask you if I get something for myself. You know what I mean? I mean, I got a hot plate, right? But it don't work when I plug it in. Is he talking out of the side of his neck, I mean? Nah, 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 nah. No disrespect, OG. Are you mocking me? Nah, not at all. Mm. Nah. Because I'll bust your motherfucking grave. <laughs> I didn't even mean it like that. Hey, 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 hey. Go back to your cell, all right? But I want to ask no you... No list for you tomorrow. Go on. Yeah, but I didn't even mean... Hey! Go back to your cell. All right, I'm sorry, CEO. I didn't mean nothing. But it's actually, you can see, Matt doesn't want to let it go. He wants him to be punished. But it's Palmer who says, you know, let it go. He's not going to get lunch tomorrow. So, you know, then you start to think, well, maybe Palmer is back in control. And, you know, he was talking to him before about the rumour of Tilly, get your boy in line. There's, you know, there's this rumour that she's, you know, being inappropriate with your boy. I don't yeah. think he uses the word inappropriate, but then you see Matt go off and talk to Sweat about it. Yeah, everybody knows. Everybody knows. I think that that's something that David Sweat even says in his, his an interview is that there are no secrets in a prison. Everybody knows what everybody's doing. Yeah, well, and that's why it's so risky. And... Now he has to sort of try to rein him in because he thinks this is going to screw up what they have going. Yeah, the risk attached to it. So you kind of get this scene where Matt's, you know, almost whispering to sweat. And I think he says something like, you know, do you think it's a good idea playing doctors, uh, you know, with the, the tailor shop supervisor? And then, you know, makes it clear where she's married and she's married to a guy who works, who works in here. here. Yeah, so yeah. that could be trouble for them. Right, right. So in the, in the real background of, of this story, um, Lyle would come by the tailor shop all the time and he was just as friendly to the inmates as she was. So it was a very normalized thing. So he didn't really think anything of it that she would give them chocolates and this and that. And David Sweat is interviewed as saying that he really liked Lyle, that he was a great guy and um, uh, talked too much. They all, they all, he says that the, they both of them just talked too much. Um, and talking can get you into a lot of trouble. Talk right. is cheap and, as they used to say in the Met, loose lips sink ships. Right. You know, in, this, in this kind of environment, that, that's very true. So then you get this sort of cut to the yard where you hear that Matt, you know, is drinking an Irish coffee. <laughs> so the introduction of alcohol, which obviously is a theme, you know, across right. this show. And I guess with the mundaneness of prison life, you know, making moonshine and hooch and all this kind of stuff. But again, you've got people rallying around Matt, which kind of, again, establishes him as sort of top dog in there. 
Uh, but they're sat there painting, you know, they're doing their art. And that's what we start to understand bonds these two together, Matt and Sweat, through the artwork. But it's actually Matt who's sort of more the accomplished artist trying to mentor young Sweat. Um, and this is probably where the best line is in, in the show, isn't it? And I, and I think, Lisa, you picked this out as well. But, you know, you've got the young um, Sweat trying to go, I call it off piece, trying to do things and then trying to explain when Matt's calling him out saying, oh, you haven't got the shadows and that doesn't work. And Where's the light coming from? Why is there light on that? You know, yeah. Yeah, Where's the window? He's trying to cover yeah. himself and make it look like that was intentional. But then Matt turns around to him and says, a kind of uh, master to, to the mentee, you know, learn the basics. Then if you want to go disco, fuck it, go disco. Which is <laughs> it's the best line. In his accent as well, it's brilliant. Yeah, the way yeah. That he... I have to know if that ever, where they got that from, if, the, you know, if, if that was an ad lib from Mr. Del Toro. So Brett, Michael, Token, Ben, let me know. Was the, whose genius line was that? Uh, this is outside in that yard, right, on the hill. It's gorgeous yep. scenery. I mean, right. it's just... And that's something that's very unique to this prison. Yeah fact is that they each, that groups of inmates have earned the right to have these little plots of land, like little farms, little cooking areas, little seating areas, little painting areas, whatever they are, whatever they use them for. But it's their real estate to use as they please. And that seems really weird. But in fact, it's a way to actually keep these prisoners in line because it's a benefit they're given. And if you act badly, it gets taken away. And so this is a way to control without chains, without guns, without violence. It's a way to control inmate behavior. And it's very effective, apparently. Well, this is where they had the ski jump as well, isn't it? I was looking yeah. back at I some of that footage. That. I mean, yeah. come yeah. on. I mean, yeah. 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 It's yeah. very bizarre when you it see is. them all ski jumping. And, but, I, you know, I guess they've got to pass the time somehow. Yeah, it's but ski be jumping? I mean, I know. first of all, can you think of a more dangerous thing to be doing? <laughs> I mean, I just don't get it. Bizarre. That's because you've got an aversion to, play, pl- to go. strapping <laughs> two planks of wood or I not necessarily do. wood anymore to, to the bottom of your feet and then facing downhill. We've That's had this conversation true. many times, Jim. That's <laughs> true. I do not want to slide down a mountain with slippery things on my feet. Just not a cool right. thing for me. Well, these Plus, guys did. I mean, many of them yeah. actually fell off the jump as well. I mean, <laughs> they, they didn't look like they dangerous. injured themselves. But, yeah, they, they kind of have this freedom, you know, of sorts to sit mm-hmm. out there and paint and do their art and get alcohol. And, yeah, the scenery is stunning. It yeah. really is. And stark contrast to the prison, but the mountains and you get a sense of freedom and liberation being out there. Have you noticed how hard it is to buy somebody a great gift that you know that they would really love? I mean, it's just getting harder and harder. And not just for the holidays, but for birthdays and for graduations and all kinds of special occasions. You always want to get somebody just that perfect little something that shows how much you love them and how much you really get them. And that's where Man Crates comes in. No matter what your loved one, your friend, your teacher, your coworker, no matter what they're into, Man Crates has got a great crate for them. For example, you could get somebody a knife making kit or a grill master kit for somebody who's the king of the barbecue and it comes with a cast iron smoker box and a brass knuckle meat tenderizer. I mean, there's such unique crates for the very unique people in your life. For example, I got for my table this holiday season, the whiskey appreciation crate, which has a personalized, beautiful decanter that has my initials on it. And also these really cute little personalized whiskey tumblers. And it's just going to make my table look so nice. There are all kinds of other crates, no matter what, your giftee is into, Man Crate has the perfect gift. With Man Crates, you're going to be giving more than a gift. You're going to be giving a gift experience that they will surely remember. And every Man Crate comes with a 100% satisfaction guaranteed. So listeners to our show, buy one gift and you will get the second gift for 25% off when you go to mancrates.com slash real crime. This offer is only good for the holidays. So buy one gift and get the second one 25% off mancrates.com slash real crime. Mancrates.com slash real crime. When you hear somebody killed somebody or somebody's in prison, it, it paints a very loud sort of one dimensional portrait And it was shocking to me when we went and talked to David that he was a person, right? I mean, he's still a 
human being behind bars in a cage and uh, to see that he had a sense of intelligence, uh, that he maybe could have been an engineer or something if he hadn't grown up in the system and fallen into trouble at a young age. You, you know, just making contact with a real person uh, was actually kind of hard and scary and confusing uh, and really intense. But near the end of this episode, we get much more clearer sense of the relationship between Tilly and her husband. Um, they go to a museum. They, they, you see them spending some time together, and you can just see Patricia Arquette has this almost permanent purse to her mouth whenever she's around him. It's like she's sucked That's on a lemon. That's her dentures. That's, she's put, got some plates in <laughs> Yeah, but I think that she's hold, it's like she holds her tension in the mouth. It's a wonderful character choice. It's like, you know, she just wants to tell him to, you know. Well, obviously, she's not respecting their marriage. Right. Obviously, right. she's hiding something. Doesn't well, really he sees what he wants stuff. to see, right? Yeah. And I think that we are all guilty of that at times. I mean, as, as professionals, you know, we see it a lot in terms of our work we've talked about lots of cases where someone starts dating someone you know I'm thinking about a case in particular and they miss all the warning signs because you see what you want to see right. but actually you know Tilly's pissed in this scene because Sweat has basically rejected her and that again is kind of quite a pivotal scene where Sweat has obviously thought about what Matt told him mm. and when Tilly calls him into the little room, the storeroom, he actually rejects her advances and so, you know, and he says that, um, you know, that he's the one that's being smart and, but she is visibly very upset by the fact that he doesn't want to you know, have oral sex, basically, and she feels rejected. And then we cut to the, the, the yard, and then we get to the war museum where Tilly and Lyle are, are sat there, and it is a great scene, and you've got Bang Bang playing in the background. Yeah, I wrote that down too. I wrote that down too. <laughs> bang Bang into the room. And, you know, Tilly, who, uh, you know, is clearly pissed. She doesn't want to spend time with Lyle, and she's sort of saying, I'm giving you half an hour max, but she sits there nonetheless, and then he approaches or he broaches the subject I should say of you know what's going on between her you know and one of the inmates in the tailor's shop because he's hearing rumors too people are going out of their way to kind of you yeah, know of course tip him off Dennis was saying you've been talking a lot with one of the inmates it's called doing my job no just one guy it's probably Amy Sweat. He's helping me make the superintendent suit. This, uh, Dennis may sound like... It's a three-piece suit, Lyle. Oh, okay. And who is it that gives us promotions? The superintendent. Exactly. So, when the guy who gives us promotions asks me, the shop supervisor, to make him a suit for graduation, and my best guy is Amy Sweat, who's been in that shop Longer than I have. Who do you think I'm going to be working with on this project? Fucking Amy Sweat. I just need to yeah. explain to me. This movie sucks. I'm going for a walk. No, you're not coming with me. Huh? Why? Because I'm mad at you. Why? You know why. You know, again, just with, with some of this, and I, you know, whether it comes from the the real life, you know, is it something that's ad libbed or not? But you know, she comes up with the fact that the superintendent's asked her to make uh, a suit, and therefore, because the superintendent hands out the promotions, then of course she's going to do it, and she's got to use her best supervisor to to help her. And we do get a sense of her. Uh, ability to be able to lie and cover her tracks and sort of turn it back on him. But also in that scene, I mean, she gets up and leaves and you get the sense of him and his victimhood in this, yeah. that he's kind of left like this little puppy on his own. And he loves her so he much. He wants to go with her and she's like, no, you're not coming with oh. me. And she just sort of leaves him there and off she goes. And again, it's a hark back as she's walking on her own in this kind of quite isolated, remote uh, place, a sense of her invisibility and isolation. And, and you know, looking back at that scene, you know, she's wearing the airborne mum top, you know, I raised a hero. Um, and all of her colours are clashing and, you know, no one really looks at her until there's a guy coming out of a bar with two young women. Yeah, and to me, it seemed like it was almost like a dream. You right. didn't get that? Well, of sweat, do you mean? The guy who... You she... mean the old man and the two young... Yeah, like Women, that that was actually sweat, 
yeah. like playing out this fantasy that he had, mm. and she's observing it. Yeah. I don't know. I, I did get that impression that she was picturing herself as being seen in that way because this guy is looking at these two women and the intimacy, the kissing, and she's hankering after yeah. that, that excitement, and it's a stark contrast to her. Uh, you know the fact that she is invisible. I've got to say, you know, the, you know, some women have shared with me that once they hit a certain age, you know, around the fifty, sixty mark, that they do feel invisible. Mm. And you know, I think that that is a very real feeling. And you know, we all want to be seen. We all want to be heard. And it's part of our our nature to want to be seen and heard. But she's craving something more, and you really feel that in this scene. Mm-hmm. But much more about the male attention, and maybe it's a stark contrast to her life. Life with Lyle. Yeah. It's just so boring mm. and the monotony and the, the drudgery and lack of excitement, you know, within this 20 year marriage. Right, right. And just a little background I think it was well known that she was not happy in her marriage. She would humiliate him when he would come into the tailor shop and make fun of him. And mm. she would, she was often heard saying that, you know, he was worth more dead than alive. She, she was just very vocal in her unhappiness in her marriage and just, again, talked too much. She talked to anybody who would listen. Uh, right, when just, where you feel alive. Yeah. And you see Patricia Arquette portray that, her coming alive in that environment. You know, she yeah. gets woken up and she's mm-hmm. hankering after that. Of course, then you get the, the contrast again with Sweat. Uh, you know, he's having this argument with his mum on the phone and then it cuts to him, Sweat, going up to Tilly and giving her this little pair of trousers that he's made. <laughs> Which is kind of pretty pathetic, I, I got to yeah. say. But in the the fact that what else can you make or give somebody as a gift, and you know she's the tailor supervisor after all, and then he gives her this you know handmade little pair of trousers, which to her is like a diamond ring. Yeah, she obviously took it as a as a token of love and affection, and she kept it secret and she cherished it. Right, and I just wonder whether you know you see the. Uh, the contrast of him rowing with his mother on the phone and then kind of the Tilly sex scene again where she says to him, to, you know, I'm not a dog and she wants to be turned round. But is that an intentional, you know, this is where the language comes in, the, you know, who's who's your boy and who's your mummy? For me, it harked back to that conversation that he was having with his mother that right. was... Uh, you know, quite visceral where he's getting very angry with her. And she, he's 16 years, uh, her junior, right? Tilly's 51, he's 35. So there is a significant age gap between the two of them. Right, but they're in this world that all of those things don't matter when you're just in this little bubble. Bubble, right. So yeah, I mean, the language is fascinating, this whole kind of role play, almost that she's the mother figure, you know, who's my boy and call me mummy, that kind of stuff. But of course, we don't really know. Is, is that the language that they were using? Because of course, they denied having sexual intimacy or being sexual with each other. But I guess we should ask yeah. whether that's something that was ad-libbed or uh, what they can tell us about it. Yeah, but it's disturbing in that it sort of almost sets up this sort of incestuous kind of situation. And it's already, even though the real power is on the part of Tilly and not on Sweat's part, it sort of makes it seem as though he is demeaning her yeah. with what he's doing, and it's just it's distasteful. Yeah. Well, that kind of role playing and that you know, is this a kind of an intimacy of sorts? That's kind of you know what I felt about it is trying to show that there's some this kissing and making up. Yeah. You know that yeah. there's some kind of intimacy there that it's more than just the sex, which is why she says, you know, I'm not a dog. I turn me round yeah. so we can see each other. And then you start to feel, I mean, I started to feel actually there is this kind of intimate relationship. But then the theme of gifts keeps coming up, doesn't it? You then have, and you've got some brilliant music in the background of, I think it was Chains. You know, who's in Chains, but Chains is playing. Then you have Palmer giving his wife the, the picture that's painted by Matt. And she's delighted with this gift. And at the same time, you know, we then cut to Catherine Leahy Scott interviewing Tilly asking, did you ever give or receive gifts? And she says no. And Catherine Leahy Scott has already said right at the the start, if you lie to me, I will know, because I'm going to ask you questions I already know the answers to. Mm -hmm. 
and she says, I know about the gifts. And then you get this kind of pathetic titty, oh, I thought you might know about them. Um, and I think that they're, they're all very interesting scenes that have been threaded together. You know, that's mm. where there's some brilliance. You can watch it and watch it a number of times. And I say to our listeners, definitely watch it a couple of times because you will see things. Oh, yeah. that, there's, there's so much. So many moments, so many moments. I, you know, I didn't write down who says this. I think it might be um, Benicio's character. Out in nature, there are no right angles. But in here... There are all right angles, and I think that it must. It, this must have been Richard Matt because he's so focused on on getting out and what's out there, and that he's constantly confined by all the right angles in here. And he seems a little bit jealous, a little bit jealous of the relationship that um, Sweat has with Tilly after they make up. His friend didn't take his advice and stay away from her. You think he's jealous because that's. A violation of their bromance or Ooh. his authority or Ooh. because he actually wants to get with Tilly himself? I think that he he wants to use her and he can't hmm. while David Sweat is in the way. Well, I mean, some individuals, particularly if they're psychopaths, never see a can't. They just see everything as opportunity. So mm -hmm. it's going to be very interesting to see, you know, how that develops. And, and I think that Catherine Leahy, Scott and Tilly, that whole interaction, which I loved right from the start, you know, the fact we never see Tilly's face in all the first shots. We just see the back of her and then we hear her voice. Mm -hmm. But And she kind of gets more, I, I guess, bolder throughout that interview. But Catherine Leahy Scott is just fantastic as a, as, a, as a character in this. But also the real Catherine Leahy Scott, who, you know, is phenomenal, who then starts to put the pressure on Tilly by saying, you know, it, it would, you would probably prefer that both of them end up dead because you're the only one who knows what really went on. And I think psychologically what she's trying to do is let Tilly know that all this intimacy and the gift sharing is that, you know, if you don't tell us what you know, they will end up dead. And because mm -hmm. she cares about them, she's trying to leave her into her a little bit here because you see Tilly's face look, you know, pretty horrified about the thought of, you know, sweat being killed at that point. Yeah. And what, uh, what color was uh, Catherine Leahy Scott wearing? <laughs> What scene. color was her blouse? <laughs> she was actually wearing a tweed blazer in a beautiful magenta. So there you go. <laughs> and uh, I think realize. it was like a cream blouse, wasn't it? But I mean, the final scene is is Palmer and Matt. So you then get the last sense of, uh, you know, what what's going on with Palmer giving the heads up to Matt that there's going to be a shakedown. And, you know, so he's g giving him the nod because, of course, he's giving him contraband and paints, etc. And then you see him go out to the catwalk. Oh, so yeah, this is the major thing. This, yeah, this is really point. kicks it. A huge reveal, and yeah. this starts the ball rolling yeah. that will end eventually in an escape at Danamora. We have so much more to talk about, so stay tuned. If you like our podcasts, there are a few things you can do. You can take two minutes and go to Apple Podcasts and leave a five-star review. You can also check out all Real Crime Profile offers and promotions and our sponsors in our show notes. Another thing you can do is go to Facebook and like our Facebook page, and you can also follow us on Twitter at Real Crime Profile without the E. And one last thing, please tell your friends, family and colleagues about us and spread the Real Crime Profile word. Thank you so much for listening. We really appreciate all of our listeners. Real Crime Profile is produced and edited by Paul Francis Sullivan. Sound engineering by Mike Thal. Music is composed by Simba Tsumba. Logo art by Jim Clementi. Real Crime Profile is produced by XG Productions and distributed by Wondery. For advice and support if you're experiencing stalking in the UK, you can contact Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service on 0203 866 4107 or you can go to the website where there's a lot of information and advice that you can follow on www.paladinservice.co.uk. If you're experiencing domestic abuse, you can call the National Domestic Violence Helpline for free on 0800-2000-247. In the US, if you're experiencing domestic abuse and need advice, shelter or counselling, you can call Genesis, the 24-hour hotline, on 214-946-4357. You can also go to their website for further advice or support, www.genesisshelter.org. And there's the Domestic Violence Hotline on 800 799 7233.